because as I uh, mentioned, where am I there? As I mentioned last week, it's like all the classes, they build on top of each other, right? And the first two classes especially are geared towards giving us all a pretty solid foundation in terms of like some of the basic, not only skills, right, but also process, processes, right, that will make it easier to develop your drawings consistently um, and with a greater degree of understanding from, you know, kind of like in a, in a way we're moving from something that's very general and very simple, right, towards something that's um, very specific, right, and complex, right? So on this side of things, we're basically moving from structure right, and basic shape towards details here. Right? And this is kind of, this is, an, this is a counterintuitive way of doing anything when it comes to, well, when it comes to building, drawing, or, et cetera, because we're detail-oriented creatures because of the way that our physiological, psychological makeup is structured. Right? So we're kind of working at cross purposes to the way that we're naturally geared. Right? But this makes a huge difference in terms of making things not only easier to understand, right, but also easier to do. So with that in mind, a continuation of where we kind of like left off with those basic geometric shapes like last week, where you have your horizon line. <clears throat> Right. And again, that warm up stuff that you were doing last week, before you start doing your assignments, I just would suggest just like spend some time while you're doing something else. Right. And you're just like scribbling on a, a notepad or a magazine, right. Or something like that while you're preparing to do, or while you're getting ready to do that. You can even do that while you're watching, you know, a movie or I mean, YouTube clips or whatever the case may be. Okay. Just something so that you're not just diving in, um, diving in cold. Now, as I mentioned last week, we're going from this really simple shape here, and then using that really simple shape as a way of constructing an idea of what that is and what that is, right? Simply because this is the easiest thing to understand. It's easy, it's just as, and it's easy to subdivide. And then from there, we're going into, you know, the dimensional equivalence of that. Et cetera. Now, I mean, I kind of, to be fair, I mean, I kind of left you guys out in the wind right, last class in the sense that we didn't spend a lot of time doing this, right? And there's good reason for it, right? So most of the cylindrical stuff, conical stuff, spherical stuff, right? If elliptical stuff, if that stuff didn't really make a lot of sense, right, there's for good, there's good reason for it. And the reason that we didn't go over it last week is just, it's just too much shit, right? All at the same time. Right? But it's useful to kind of get an introduction to it, give it a try, so to speak, before right, we start diving into it specifically. Now, the reason that this works so well in this regard is that, you know, when we come to, say, that flipping the coin example that we went over last day, where you've got the edge of the coin on the horizon line as part of your assignment, then you get a thin ellipse, a thicker ellipse, an even thicker ellipse, an even thicker ellipse, until you end up with you know, a perfect circle at one end of the spectrum or doing the exact same thing in the other direction. This is difficult because curvy things are a lot less, are a lot less easy to put some sort of like, this is the way this looks right, and like a zero decimal point type of accuracy, or a second decimal point type of accuracy. Whereas this is quite a bit easier, right, to do, right, because it's got more definable characteristics. This has got definable characteristics, but they're very difficult to put down, which means that if we can get this thing, right, into perspective, then we can more easily control this thing, because that thing and that thing relate to each other in a very predictable way. 
when you put this circle inside of a square, right, because of the, the nature of their geometry, those things contact each other at four what are called tangent points or quadrant points. So when we're connecting the corners of a square, right, in order to say find the central pivot point of a pyramid or the peak of a triangle, what we're also doing is identifying through that central pivot point where the crosshairs of the front and the back edge and two side edges are going to be of that, or of that square and where the circumference of the circle is gonna intersect with that square. So basically what we need in order to find this right, is a way of figuring out how to draw a square in perspective. Right? So this is relatively easy because the system that we're using literally defines that particular thing with respect to your two points and their one point and the one point. So if I was to draw a square flat on the ground, and as I mentioned last day, is like we can draw perspective objects starting from anywhere. It doesn't matter if we're starting it from the front, from the back, the side, the corner, it doesn't make any difference. Starting it from the front just made it easier for me to talk about last day. What I was suggesting doing last day is basically just guessing where that back edge of the square was going to be if it was lying flat on the ground or otherwise. And for the most part, that's good. Right? But if we want to do this academically, so we want to find out if it's actually a square right? so that we can put in actually a circle inside of it, or if we want to use this as a way of then constructing other things that we're going to do in four or five classes in terms of like repetitive values, et cetera. How I would do that is taking this front corner here and then dragging a diagonal line until it connected to there, or do the exact same thing in the opposite direction. So you're taking the corner of either front edge of that square and then attaching it to its opposing two point. So when I do, whoop, so when I do this, and when I do that, where those lines cross over these recessional lines that I've already set up going back to my central one point, those two things should line up directly across from each other. And that's the back edge of your square in perspective. Right? And this is definitive of how to find this. Right? So simply by using the system, if you set up this relationship, that's going to be the case. Right? It's never going to be anything different. So what you've essentially done here is done this. Right? You've crossed the, uh, connected the corners of that square. You've just done it in a very particular way. Now, the nice thing about this is that, again, if I take this central pivot point and then attach it back to your central vanishing point and extend that forward, I now have a contact point on the front and the back edge of that square. If I take a horizontal line straight through that pivot point, that will then contact the side edges and give me these two points here. So what I essentially get is the diameter in this way and the diameter in this way. Right? And you can continue doing this indefinitely. There's another square. There's another square. There's another square, et cetera. Okay, so being able to do this is going to be useful not only in terms of like finding this stuff, right, but also for compositional purposes right, as we move or as we move forward. Now, moving from this towards a circle is you know slightly slightly different and that's because when we look at a circle straight down and say that i've got a central pivot point and there are my front and back edges of that particular thing the diameter of that thing is we can find a diameter in any direction there's a potentially infinite array of diameters right to that but let's say that we've got a person standing here and we're looking down onto that person and that person is looking straight ahead at some sort of elliptical shape that's lying in a perspective field in front of them the ellipse that this person sees right its diameter is still going to be the same so its diameter is found by finding this thing here that's no different the problem is, is that the diameter isn't the visually widest part of an ellipse in perspective, right? For much the same reason that 
you know, when we did this last week, you can't see over top of the curvature of the earth. The curvature of the earth physically blocks out a view of a portion of that object. Well, the curvature of this ellipse physically blocks out the view of the diameter as well. So because we have a cone of vision that extends out from a central point, that cone of vision intersects a point that's in front of the diameter that becomes the widest part of the ellipse. This is what's called your visual axis. And the visual axis is always slightly in front of the diameter. Now where in front is easy enough to find. You take the distance from the back edge to the front edge of the square and divide that in half. And where that halfway point is gives you the contact point of those sections of the ellipse with respect to the square. Right, so effectively what it is that I've done, there's my circle. And there's my square. Done this, I found that. And my visual axis is just being pushed forward a little bit. Now, another way of finding the arc or how big this arc is on one side uh, in each individual quadrant of that square is that if you divide up these angles here into thirds, that arc generally aligns with the two third mark of that angle. So that means that you can take this space here and divide it up into thirds have an idea of where that contact point is, and then literally draw a quadrant by quadrant. There's one section of the arc. There's another section of the arc. And same thing for the back. And each one of these squares is gonna have their own central pivot point. They're gonna have their own visual axis and they're gonna have their own thickness of ellipse. So the reason that the square is relatively useful in terms of finding the thickness of the ellipse is that it's really academic to find a square. There's no trick to it, right? But feeling out the thickness of that ellipse, it does come in time, right? But it might not necessarily be the first thing that's most obvious to you. Okay, how does that sit with everybody so far? Uh, I was lost pretty much like halfway through, but after we finished it, I figured it. Okay, how about anybody else? I, I just have a question. If you just ignore the halfway point, like the, the visual axis and do the circle based on like the square, will it become like wonky? Sorry, what do you mean ignore the visual axis and... So, so like if I only use the, for like to do the ellipse or circle, if I only use the, the parts on, on like the perspective square. Yeah. So like if you do, instead of the midway point, so I find the visual axis, I just use the midway point on the square. You mean the diameter? Yeah, yeah, the diameter. Will it become like wonky? Yeah, so if I do that, so if I make another square out here, I just double this right, and put another one out here. Or I could extend a line from here through that corner, extend it out, right, and extend this line until they intersect. That should give the same answer and then bring another line down here like that. So there's my square there. Well, there's my diameter there. So now if I'm using this as the widest part of my square, look what happens. It gets crunchy back here and it gets 
thick up here. You know, I'm exaggerating to make a point here, right? But it pushes the center of the ellipse too far back. And as a result, you kind of start to get something that's more like rugby ball shaped, right? Or asymmetrical in a way. Now, I don't want you to think that there's, this turns into some sort of like dog and pony show every time that you got to do an ellipse, you got to make a square and like figure that shit out. It's not the case. Most of the time, what you're doing is like, once you kind of get a sense of this, is like, all right, that's what an ellipse looks like there. That's what an ellipse looks like there. That's what an ellipse looks like there. And so on and so forth. It's, it's basically just about developing a visual sensitivity towards how thick that ellipse should be at varying points with respect to the horizon line. That makes sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, well, we can also do this on a vertical as well. So if I take a vertical edge and then attach the top and bottom of that <coughs> back to the central vanishing point again, here's the front edge of a vertical square, top and bottom of that square. And now, right, do we, uh, do we do station points last day? Center of vision, station points? I think we did. No, I don't think we did. The distance from here to here and the distance from here to here is equidistant. Well, along this center of vision, right, from your one point, you also have two points above and below the horizon that are also equidistant away from the one point. So these two points and these two points are the same distance away from that one point. It's basically like you've just done this. You've just made a cross. Now we can use these station points right, in the same way that we can use your two points in order to find the back edge of a vertical square. Right? So that if you want to develop something like a clock face or a wheel, right, et cetera, versus a manhole cover, right? these are both useful, useful tools to have. Your vertical axis is found exactly the same way. Halfway point between the front and the back edge. Which is going to sit slightly in front of the diameter. Your central pivot point still gets connected back here to give you a contact point there and there. And your ellipse still fits into that space in exactly the same way. And just like I can replicate that from on a horizontal plane, I can replicate that on a vertical plane. Right? And it doesn't matter what direction I do it in, I'm still gonna get the same answer. Okay, how are we with that? Okay, because what each one of these things now gives me the opportunity to do is that, say that I'm gonna draw this thing properly here just to get it out of the way. That diameter is still a useful point of reference to have, right? Because if I wanna draw a cone up from this point, well, now I use that as the point where that vertical height starts at. But where I attach the edges of that to is the visual axis, right? So when I attach this down here and this down here, that gets attached slightly in front so that this thing feels like it's wrapping around that thing. Right? And same thing with a cylinder. My vertical axis would tell me where, or sorry, my visual axis would tell me where that cylinder was gonna start. Right? And then I would have another square up here telling me where the top of that cylinder was and it would be connected to another visual axis. 
Okay, so basically you're just controlling the extremity of that ellipse as it goes closer to further away from the horizon line, either above or below. How are we doing so far? Okay, screenshot that. Hmm. Part one of your assignment right, is basically just doing a version of that, right? And again, it's one of those repetitive exercises that, you know, is just designed to be repetitive so that it just grinds this information into you through rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. This will be the last one of these things that we do. <coughs> okay. Part one of your assignment is to do this. I want you to make me Oops, a nine square grid, both horizontally and vertically. So what do I mean by that? And what's an easy way of doing that? Say that there's the front edge of my square. Okay. This is going to give you one square in this direction. We already know how to create that first square. Do this. There's a square. How do I create another square right behind it? Somebody. So you just attach it from the other corner. So you go up and you go from the left corner to the right of the horizon line. So if I start here, where am I going? Yeah, I'm going right. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I just go over there. And I can do the exact same thing in the opposite direction. And so that gives me my three squares in that direction. Now, as I've mentioned, there's a couple of different ways of creating the other ones. An easy way of doing this, so I could just take this distance and you could use a ruler to measure this out if you really wanted to. Duplicate it over here. Duplicate it over here. As long as they were the same length, that would be fine. Another way of doing that would be to extend this line until it crossed over this line that you extended out. That should give you, that should give you the same answer. And if you're doing it in the opposite direction, it should also give you the same answer. This is definitive of how one point and two point relate to each other, right? So they can't function in any other way, as long as the measurements are accurate. As soon as I have where these two front sections are here, I just connect these lines back to that section or to that central point. That gives me the recessional edges of either side. And now I just extend these horizontal lines out. There's your nine square horizontal grid. You could start this by doing this vertically. It wouldn't make any difference. Right? But once you've got that down, now you've got the capacity to draw right, a vertical version of that. Right? So this distance here would be the same distance as that there. So again, you could measure that either by ruler right, or by, you know, my poor man's ruler there. Duplicate that, triplicate that. That line there should be the same distance as that line there. Once you've got that down, Connecting the dots back here to get the top and bottoms of all the or of the entire grid. Drag these vertical lines straight up. And that's a quick and dirty version of your nine square grid on a vertical. 
inside each one of these squares, you're gonna put an ellipse. And each one of those ellipses is gonna have a diameter. And a visual axis. Once you found it here or here or here, then we can just drag that information straight up right, and find the exact same information on a vertical. So then your job is to ellipse, ellipse, nine ellipses there. And same thing here. Not only, again, does this help you practice that motion and making those shapes, right, but also should start to give you an indication right, of how different those ellipses look as they start to move toward or away from your center of vision or toward or away from your horizon line. Okay, so that's part one of your assignment. Right? And the cash value of that right, should be obvious right now in terms of like making cones, making ellipses, making spheres, making cylinders, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> okay, so that's, basically a gloss on what we did last week. Any questions about that? Because this is foundational for what we're gonna do for the rest of the class here. Could you repeat the part where you said that the, um, I guess the, the vertical line is the same length of the horizontal line? This line here, imagine that you're making a big cube divided up into nine parts on every side. This front edge here, by default of defining a cube, would be the exact same length as this line here. And then each individual third would be the exact same length here. It's just an easy way of doing it. And so you don't have to you know, create an entirely separate grid for the vertical. Does that clarify anything? Yeah, I think so. Cool. <clears throat> Again, there's a step-by-step -step of how to do this in the handout, right, for this particular class. <clears throat> okay, so go ahead and screenshot this. Because the bulk of your assignment is gonna be put towards using all of these geometric objects now to finally develop something that looks like something. Okay, and this allows me to introduce right, some process right, as well. Right, now, just like this geometric perspective stuff that we've met with that well have spent the first two classes doing or this class and a half doing, this process is now just going to be back or is going to be background information from this point forward. And what I mean by background information is essentially there's going to be an expectation that to varying degrees or to some sort of degree anyway, you're going to be going through this process for every assignment that you go through from this point forward. Right. So I'd like to start this course off this way because everybody's aware of this. Right? The more time that you spend doing this, the better your drawings get, the more consistent your drawings get. It's a very effective way of starting to think about image creation in general, not only just perspective drawing. Okay, so at base, again, the process of this is moving from general towards specific. Shape and structure towards 
detail. Right, and this gives me an opportunity to kind of outline right, something that we left out last week, where it's like, we're talking about different kinds of perspectives. The kind of perspective, again, that we're dealing with is linear perspective, right? And what linear perspective is, is recessional, right? Which means that the lines of your objects are all going towards a particular point or two particular points. Right? That's all that recessive means, right? Or recessional means. There's different kinds of perspective though. One is called isographic. Isographic is really useful for say like floor plans. Floor plans or say object graphic design. Now we're not really using this, right? Other than as some sort of start point for making this stuff a little bit easier to understand. What's characteristic of isographic projection, right? And I should say this like all perspectives. Perspective in general are just different categories of what's called graphical projection. What's characteristic about an isographic projection is that all corners, consider, if you're considering a rectilinear object, are always 90 degrees to each other, which means you've got very, very limited views. So let's say take like a, a really simple example of, um, of a house. Well, the bottom or the front of that house might be like that. The top of that house might be like this. That's all an isographic projection is. So the front might look like that, the back might look like that. When I rotate that into say a profile, that just gives me an idea of how long the house is versus how tall the house is. If I was to look at this from the bottom, maybe I would be able to then see that the base of the house is narrower than the top of the house, i.e. the roof, and the top of the house overlaps that, overhangs that by about that amount. And if I was to look at this thing from the top, then all I would be able to see is the roof because it overhangs the bottom entirely. So this is just giving you very, very simple versions right, of an object. Right? And that simplicity becomes really beneficial in terms of trying to figure out how to draw a particular object because it breaks down into brass tacks, basically. Another one that's worth me mentioning, right? But we're not gonna use at all, but it is worth mentioning because people often do this just by accident, right? Because it looks so similar to linear perspective, it's axonometric perspective. There's a couple different variations of this, right? That vary based on the angle of the lines that you're dealing with. One's 33, de or one's 33 degrees, another one is 45 degrees, right? But you can have variations basically any angle. But what's consistent about all of them is that lines run parallel to each other indefinitely. They never recede to a particular point. And generally speaking, right, they're done, well, they're always done in what would we would approximate as a two point. These are really useful for architectural renderings. Right. Reason being is because they don't recede to a particular point, we don't run into the problem of distortion, which we haven't really talked about yet. But because these things are running parallel to each other, 
you never have any sort of distortion. So I can build up from any point on here. And that object is always gonna have the same sort of characteristics. Kind of looks like perspective that we're dealing with, but isn't, All right? So I raise this just so that you avoid it. Right? Our lines always have to recede to a particular point. Now, what we are gonna be using is this thing a little bit. Screenshot this. Because the process that we're gonna go through is roughly divided up into three general stages. And that isographic projection helps you to identify what that initial stage is gonna be. So first stage of your process right, is gonna be what we call the mass shape of a particular thing. So let's go back to that house. I know the front and the side look like that. And let's just say for the sake of argument that the top and the bottom look something like that. This is really simple, but it's still not simple enough. What we want to do for a mass shape is take the widest part of this object in every direction and then drop a box around it. Okay, so effectively, we're reducing that thing down into some sort of rectilinear shape that has one part to it. That's it. There are, there are no, there are no subparts. Now, doing this allows me to do some interesting and some useful things. First off, right, I know that this thing has to be this tall, about that wide, about that thick. So when I start drawing that thing, in perspective, I'm now not worried about The individual parts of things. All I'm worried about is what does that shape look like, that very simple shape look like in that perspective, in that position. Likewise, provides me a quickly alternating a view and kind of getting a sense of what that shape looks like. in that perspective, at that position. And hopefully you can kind of already start to see the value in doing this. I can basically alternate positions really, really quickly, really, really easily. I can alternate scales. Really quickly, really easily because I'm just manipulating that single shape. I can decide whether or not I wanna draw that thing above, below, on the horizon line. And I can do it all really, really quickly because I'm only dealing with that simplified shape. So this provides you an opportunity to kind of like juggle options, so to speak, in terms of what's gonna be the best possible view based on some really limited information of this very simple shape. How's that for everybody? Okay, so that's gonna be the first part of your process. Now, what's part of, the, or part of that process, sorry, is this isographic version, 
right, of this thing. Because then this also provides a guideline for what we'll just call stage two. And sub, stage two is what we're gonna call subdivision. And by subdivision, I mean, inside this thing, there are parts. Right? There's part of the peak of the roof, there's the part of the bottom of the house. So let's say that I'm just gonna choose to use this view here. <laughs> if that's the view that I choose, with the basic understanding of that overall shape, I can now start to subdivide this thing. Now, I know that the halfway point of this thing is right about there just by doing that. This would have been easier if I would have just made that level with the bottom of the house, but whatever, or bottom of the roof, but whatever. So that means if I connect these two corners here, I find the central point of that house. And I know that the bottom of the roof is slightly below the center of that house or the center of that center line. That central point here also gives me a way of breaking this shape up right into that peaked roof there. And now starting to connect this back over here, I can do the exact same process on the other side. so that I've got an idea of what that peaked roof looks like there, and then connect those two things there. So now I have that shape separated from the mass shape. Likewise, I know that this thing here is slightly narrower, right, on all sides. So that means if I have a footprint of that thing down here, it's gonna be slightly narrower, right? And then I'm gonna bring that thing up so that it interacts with that roof in a way that is consistent with what this tells me. So basically what I'm doing is I'm carving into that initial midge or that initial mass shape. Right? And then letting the structure of the house gradually, gradually develop. Now what I can do with subdivision is that I can also add stuff to this. So let's make this a little bit bigger. I'll screenshot that. Let's make this a little bit bigger so that this becomes a bit easier to ingest. Okay, so let's say that again, that that's my, my mass shape. Again, let's just say for the sake of argument now that I'm just gonna make this line up with the halfway mark, right? Because that's just easier as a subdivision. Doing the exact same process here.
Anybody unclear on how I got there? I was just wondering, how do you make the like the first square on the floor, like the the first rectangle? There's gonna be the base of it, like. Uh, I just decide. You just decide, but like. Uh, I just decide the shape of it based on that iso isographic drawing that I did. Mm -hmm. So if I know that the length of the house is about that big, well, I'm trying to put something down here that looks kind of like that. I see. That's it. And then same thing, right? If I was to establish that smaller footprint inside of here, to a degree, I'm just deciding. And likewise, like when I bring this line up and have a contact there, there's a bit of a decision there to be made as well. The thing is like once the decision's made, it basically cascades into all the other decisions. Right, because now all of the other chunks of space have to line up with that. So that's a really simple version of subdividing. Another version of subdividing would be doing something like this. Let's say on the front of the... So here's a question. No, that was just my fault for being late. And yes, I know I'm late. And yes, I know I was late for this morning. I'm just really freaking tired. And that's my own fault. Nobody so ever would have, nobody, nobody ever would have known, man. <laughs> really? Yeah. I had no, no uh, idea. Yeah. Oh my God. I know. And now you've just given yourself up. Oh. Interpol, here we come. Okay, so another really simple version of subdividing would be to take this shape then and say, all right, well, I want a door inside of here, but I want that door to line up with the central pivot point of this bottom section here so that I can center that thing relatively easily inside there. Well, that door inside that shape has a simple two-dimensional shape to it, but it also has a three-dimensional aspect to it so that I can give that thing volume. So that when I put that thing in there, I'm now carving into that shape to make that space there. And this tends to be confusing for people because this section's visible, this section would be hidden by a wall, right? but it's the same basic two point box with different lines revealed. So doors, windows, any sort of subdivision or any sort of like ingress that you want into the side of that object, that would be another example of subdivision. Now, in a, you can also start to add stuff to this. So stuff that would be additional to the structure. Say that I wanted to put in something that looked like this. I want one of those You know, cellar doors that is going subterranean to the building. Okay. Now I can add that shape onto this shape. Another version of addition. So I want a chimney coming out of this thing. And I want that chimney to be cylindrical. Like, well, I'm finding an axis of that cylinder of that circle all along this lips or along this angle of the house that will run concurrent with the angles and the perspective of that house and then drawing directly up from there into another elliptical shape that would provide me the top of a cylinder. Likewise, I can add another shape to that that might be conical or some sort of smokestack on top of that. Likewise, I can come up off of here and let's say that I've got some sort of weather vane and that weather vane right, is spherical in shape. I can now start to identify right, the axis points on that. And then lastly and not leastly, hmm, it would be a way of doing that.
not really anything. So we're just going to make it up arbitrarily. Saying that in the backyard, the kids, they're having a play date and they've got a tent. There's the basic shape of my tent. Your job, right, for this portion of your assignment is to design me a building. Don't care what that building is, right? But you're gonna go through that stage one process and then stage two process. And in that process, you are gonna create a building using all of the geometric shapes. Right, so cone, cylinder, sphere, something cubey, something pyramidy, and something triangular. Okay, so all of those shapes have to be represented at least once in the construction of your building. Okay, so that's stage two. And this is what stage two should basically look like. Right, as simple as that. And what I mean by background information or when I refer to background information is that this is the way that ideally you're thinking about all of the objects that you draw from this point forward to varying degrees. Some objects aren't gonna require this amount of work. Some objects are, right? Because of their position inside your picture. Right? But it's a useful way to start thinking about anything or objects in general, just so that you have the capacity in order to do those things that this process allows to be a little bit easier. Okay, so that's stage three of your process. If you haven't screenshot this already, go ahead. <coughs> Stage three is what we're gonna call pattern and detail. All right, this is where in terms of like your creativity and effort and your line quality, things do start to make more of a difference. Everything up until this stage has been business as usual for the most part, all right? It's just, you know, how well do you understand it? How well can you execute it? Not really paying attention to these things other than for the amount of effort that it's going to take. From this point forward, though, right, your line quality and creativity and effort have a direct correlationship to each other, right, but also make a bigger impact on your mark. Let's say that I'm, let's say that I'm drawing that roof, for example, right, and we're just going to draw a version, a version of a roof. Okay, so that's your roof. Right now, that roof right, is just a three-dimensional shape. It's got no real depth, right? It's got no, right? It's got no volume to it. It certainly doesn't have any detail to it. Well, let's say that I wanna make that roof have some of that. Well, one way of easily doing that, right, is to develop, again, right, a rough idea of the actual three-dimensional volume of that thing, just like I was doing with the door. Right, so rather than just being a two-dimensional surface, I've now got a three-dimensional surface. Underneath here, right, now I'm establishing maybe a pattern. Oops. Pattern that still all has to be in perspective but is now starting to give me an idea that maybe the underside of that is made up of individual pieces of wood to creating the softening underneath that area. Likewise, on the roof itself. Now 
you know, starting to develop a pattern of what's going to be shingling. Right now, more on this later in terms of like how to do this in a like a repetitive or a variegated way. But for right now, I'm just following the overall angle of the roof in order to create that pattern. And then likewise here, all of these lines still need to be in perspective. But I'm now just subdividing that roof up. And I can subdivide that roof up as much as I want. And I can be as repetitive and as kind of mechanical or as variegated and organic with this as I want to. Okay, so that would be a good example of what I mean by the pattern of things. Now, the detail of things is an entirely different matter. Let's say that I take just that shingle, for example. One really simple way of drawing a shingle would just be to do this. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that other than the fact that it's fucking boring. Okay? So what we're looking to, right, is to try and get this to actually feel like a shingled roof. So if I want to draw that shingle, well, maybe I start to change, right, the kind of line that I associate with the outside of it and variegate right, the overall pressure of that line. Maybe I start to put in the idea that there's a crack in the wood here so that that shingle is a little less uniform. Maybe there's some wood grain and a knot in the wood there. And again, I can vary the intensity right, of that line right, to accentuate or de-accentuate one area or another. Maybe there's a hole in my shitty shingle that's going to cause problems for me and my pioneering family down the track. Anyway, I'm just throwing in some texture lines. That might not be a perfect shingle, but what it is, is a hell of a lot better than that, which is also a hell of a lot better than that, right? which is also a hell of a lot better than two-dimensional roof with nothing on it. Okay, so hopefully you can see what I mean by like moving from that stage one to stage three. Where you're gradually kind of building up through structures, right? More and more complicated shapes, and then ultimately getting down to a point where you have detail. Right. So let's say that, you know, I want to draw that smokestack coming out of the roof. It's like, well, I don't want that smokestack to be made of wood. And so maybe I want that thing to be made of metal going through the same process, right? I've got that basic shape and now I'm breaking up that cylindrical shape into individual shapes. But maybe I want that individual shape to be, you know, not quite so mechanical. So I've got a differing size of sheet metal here and another size here and another size here. But maybe I don't want that thing to be uniform, right? Because, you know, this is, you know, somebody who's living by their, living by their wits out in the wilderness, right? And this kind of got like a patchwork quilt of little chunks of sheet metal that are attached to this. Okay. And then as I start to detail this, maybe I'm doing things like this that might seem small, but I'm taking that initial shape and then overlapping that a little bit. So rather than just having this smooth shape coming down the side of this, I've got something that does this. Gives me a bit of variation in that. And I might be trying to vary that variation. So on this side, it might go in the opposite direction. So that I've got this shape doing this here, right? And then coming in there. Likewise, underneath here, maybe this has sheet metal coming off as well, right? But now it's
varied in terms of how it's being staggered. Maybe the shape underneath there right, has some ribbing that's coming out from the central point. Kind of looks like an old turbine. How is this stuff held together, right? Maybe there's some rivets, right? Maybe one's, you know, kind of coming out because everything's run down and shitty. Anyway, you can get as granular as you want, right, with this stuff, right, in terms of detail. But what ideally I'm looking for, right, from this point forward is that you're not just doing this. telling me that's a house, right? And I was like, well, fuck yeah, kind of, right? But it's certainly not a house like that, right? Or like that. Now, again, this stuff, to do this, this takes time, right? And this is where you're going to start doing the calculus, right? Some of you in the class, right? Well, all of you in the class are going to do the calculus. You're just going to go in one direction or another. Some of you might be really interested in going down this path, right? And that's what's going to contribute to this and this. As I mentioned, it's entirely possible to get your presentation and your objective mark, right? Um, without putting any effort into this or this at all, right? So you can get 40% without concentrating on this stuff at all, as long as it's intelligible. And if it's intelligible, then you'll get 10% here and you'll get 10% there, right? So that brings you up 60%. Somewhere in there, you gotta find the mustard to develop another 5%. Right, in order to pass this class. And that's the calculus. For those of you who want to get up to 90 and 100%, this is what I'd be looking for, right? In all instances of your picture. Right? Now, again, in order to generate the enthusiasm or in, in order to spend the time, right? In order to do this, you have to have the enthusiasm level in order to do it. You have to really want to know this or you have to really want to be able to do this. Right? And generally speaking, it's because that's got a direct and palpable interest for you. Not all of you are going to fall into that category. Right? Again, I'm fine with that. But that's what you can expect right? in terms of base rate, um, base rate marking, pay scale, so to speak. Now, for the inevitable question that will, that will arise for all of you, which will be directed towards me, how do I draw blank, right? I am not encyclopedic <laughs> in terms of my ability to draw shit. I'm really good at drawing some things. You know, I'm fucking terrible at drawing other things, right? But I've got a base level of ability that, you know, given time, I could probably figure out how to draw just about anything, right? Now, stuff that I can draw from my head. I can draw this from my head because I've drawn it a bunch of different times, right? I can draw lots of things that way. You will also have that ability. You will have certain things that you've got right, kicking around right, that you are able to draw without having to reference anything. If you, do, if you don't have that, right, and chances are very good that the amount of stuff that you can't draw right, is you know, significantly greater than somebody, or than somebody who has spent a lot of time drawing. If you have this question, first stage is not to ask me because I'm not always going to be available. I'm very rarely available. Right? I want you to go to that thing right, and type in, how do I draw fill in the blank, right? And a fucking avalanche of information will come up for you right, about people that have tried to solve that particular problem right, in the past and have come up with a variety of solutions. Right? It's easier than ever to basically do what I will from this point forward to refer to as research. Your job is to figure out how to draw those things, how to draw sheet metal, how to draw glass, how to draw wood, how to draw sand, how to draw whatever it is that you want to draw. Okay. Now, my suggestion when you do this is find something that you like right, and copy it. Okay. I don't mean trace it. Right. I mean, copy the things that you like about it because you're going to come across a bunch of different things that you like and you're not going to do a perfect facsimile of that thing. 
you're also eventually going to change that thing or those things that you like and turn it into something particularly you. Everybody in the industry or everybody that's learning this their, this particular skill set does this. You might think that it's stealing, right? People that do this for a living call it research. Okay? I highly suggest that you get used to doing it because this is going to be the thing that pushes your drawings right in the direction that they need to go as quickly as possible is learning from the shoulders of giants that you're standing on, essentially. Okay, so what I do not want to see right, in and which will almost guarantee you getting this or less is that if you're drawing grass, I don't want to see this. If you're drawing water, I don't want to see this. Okay? This isn't a cloud. These aren't birds. And this sure as shit isn't the fucking sun. Okay? I don't want to see any of that. Okay? This is just stuff that we're saddled with from kids. Right? There's nothing wrong with these, right? Given like certain stylistic applications, et cetera. Right? But as far as I'm concerned, this is just a hangover from childhood. And it's easy to raise the bar just a little bit. Okay, so I will be asking, I will be expecting this from you, right? This is what you can kind of look forward to, right? It's relatively easy to get 20% here. It's also relatively easy to get 20% here. The last 10% of either category takes a little bit more. But like I said, well, actually, I don't know if I said last class. Everybody in this class has the capacity to get to 30% quite easily in creativity and effort, right? Because I just want to see that you're trying, right, to do this. The line quality stuff, right, now it gives me an opportunity to talk about that a little bit more, right? Because 10% of that is just control, right? right? That's, that's the intelligibility part of things. Another 10% is detail, right? That's all this stuff here. The last 10%, is depth. Right. Can you make a picture feel like it has depth just by virtue of its line quality? Easy example of that. There is a school. Half of the square that you just drew is out of the, yeah, out exactly. of the picture. There is a square. Okay. Now, if I want to make that square look like it's further away from another square, one easy way of doing that is overlapping it. Another way of doing that is making the line that's behind or of that of that square behind it a little bit lighter. And if I want to make that square even further away, I make it lighter again. Okay. So the overlapping helps, but Is it necessary in terms of communicating a sense of depth? Okay, so in terms of your overall picture, dark equals close, light equals far. Okay, but also that has a lot to do with like your internal structure as well. You can see it's like when I do Right, where with this, not every single line is the same depth or the same thickness or the same darkness. There's variation in it. And that variation adds volume to those individual objects. Right? Just like that sense of depth adds space right, or depth of field to an entire picture. Okay, so that's hopefully that clarifies what I'll be looking for, right, in both of those categories. Um, you guys will inevitably have questions, right, about this. How do I improve my line quality? This will almost always be my answer, right, is you need to start focusing more on this or more on this, in some cases, even just working on that. How are we feeling about that? For me, I'm super excited, actually. <laughs> okay, well, if you guys have any 
questions about what your assignment is, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna look at the handout now and I'm gonna show you some previous student examples as well. And hopefully that'll clarify so, anything that. So do you have a three assignment? I'm gonna go over the assignment right now. Oh, and by the way, just a question. Uh, can I take a picture of a building and not trace over it? Just use it as a uh, reference. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, I don't wanna see trace drawings, right? And I don't, then this is a good point. It's like, I also don't want you tracing your own drawings, right? Cleaning them up, right? By tracing over top of them because a trace drawing just looks like a trace drawing. And I don't know if you're tracing your own drawing or somebody else's drawing, right? But needless to say, I'm not a fan of a trace drawing. Right, so let's just like cut out that middleman. Right? There's other ways to clean your drawing up right, than you know tracing directly over top of it. Um, okay, here. Okay, so this is the grid. Right, we'll go over this more when we get uh, a couple of classes down the track. Right, in terms of like lining up one point and two point grids with each other, and using that right as a way of subdividing. Same thing here. We're going to go over this in a couple of classes, right? So don't worry about that right now, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So this will be another one of those handouts that you look back on again fondly in the future. Breakdown of ellipses, visual axes, right, et cetera. All of that jazz. All right. How this stuff relates to cubes, cylinders, right? Basic shapes, blow-ups, right, of single objects, right? And then how you might start to conceptualize complex shapes, break them out into simple geometric objects, and then use those simple geometric objects to start breaking it up into something a little bit more complex and detailed. Okay. Description of your or description of your assignment. This is basically that same process divided up into a bunch of different stages, right? That we've just I've just condensed into three separate stages. So don't get confused by this. Right? This is just a little bit more particular. Right, but the same basic concept, right? So just those three stages are fine. Mash or mash shape with the isometric drawing, right? and then your overall um, subdivision into the basic geometric shapes, and then pattern and detail over top of that. I might change this so that there's no confusion as well. Right. So there's a previous student example, right, of the ellipses grid, right? That's more than is necessary, but if you feel like doing all four of them, you know, fill your boots, so to speak. There's the isometric draw, or sorry, the isographic drawing right, of their proposed building, all the shapes involved. Right? There's the blow up or blow out rather of all of those things in their basic geometric shapes. Right? And then there's the detailed version. Right of that. Okay, so that's a nice example right, of this. And generally speaking, again, the student examples that are in the handouts are 100%. Right, so this gives you a good qualitative example in terms of what you can shoot for. But isn't it, isn't the example that you just saw like isn't it trace it like no. uh, the black ink? No, it's gone over top of theirs. What I mean by trace because ah, I, 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 I get it. Yeah, I don't want you to put another piece of paper over top of this and create a brand new drawing. I'd rather mm -hmm. see the, I'd rather see the structural lines like this. Also, this yeah, is oh, looking, this is just really dark pencil. So please do not use ink, right? mm -hmm. still just HB pencil. Uh, I was thinking more like you cannot sketch and then trace the sketch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want you to do that. Because mm -hmm. okay, I want to be able to see the structural lines that you have there. Also, it's a good habit to get into to keep that initial structural line light and then the final finish line darker, right? To push that thing back. Right. And then these are just some more developed examples, right, from former students as well, right, where from completely different exercises, but the exact same sort of process. Okay, so these are a little bit sexier, right, but it's the exact same process, right, that's being gone through. Um, I might have some other examples. Just let me see if. Uh, can we do this assignment digitally or it needs to be on pencil and paper? No, you can do it digitally. All your assignments can be done digitally.
Oh, this is fucking irritating, isn't it? Let's not do that. Let's hit that. I missed it. Okay, so just some other examples to uh, add some clarification. Okay, so it's an example. Not a great example. Why do I have this in here? Oh, because of this. Right. So that's a nice job right? in terms of moving into the detail aspect of things. Could have done a better job here. Okay, but the final result, you know, says this. What this student probably did is work backwards. Right? They probably just did this drawing. Right, had a good time with it, and then did as little as possible for right, the, the other stage, which isn't quite as exciting. We've already seen this one. Oh, this is a different assignment. Okay, so same stuff, right? Just a variety of examples for you to kind of like fill your intellectual boots with. Okay, so that's quite nice. The de you do not need details, all right, on these sections of the drawing. This is just, I mean, it's nice to see, but it kind of is wasted time. Okay, and a nice example of the finished product. So this is a good example because there's perspective inconsistencies. See how this is flat here? This is drawn in one point when it should be drawn in two point. And this is why we want to get rid of, we want to work out the perspective first. And because it doesn't matter how well you draw this, it just looks messed up, right? Because the perspective is off. Oh, different assignment. Okay, so there's a wide variety of stuff that you can do. You are not limited at all other than by your imagination in terms of what it is, what kind of building you want to create. So please fill your boots. Give me something interesting to look at. Make me proud. Okay, and we're out of that. Okay, so those are the three separate pages of your assignment. This is due same time, same bad channel as is usual. So next week before one o'clock. Do you guys have any questions for me? Oh, the examples that I wanted you to watch the Simpsons and Pixels. I mean, it should be obvious like why you're, why I wanted you to watch them, right? So it's basically just like an opportunity to see as like something complex broken down into component geometric parts, right? Or made up of smaller building blocks. And so it wasn't a lot that I could do in that regard for, for this, right? But, you know, it gave you something to giggle at anyway for about 10 minutes. Okay, um, any questions for me? Other than, uh, other than questions about your individual assignments from last week, right? Those just hold off on those, but questions about this assignment or the material that we've done this class. Will you be uploading this recording today? I will. Cool. Did I not upload the recording last day? Uh, I think you uploaded it Monday or Tuesday or something, yeah. but, but there's still that YouTube video to go over. Cool. Yeah, this will get, uh, this will get converted as soon as we're done here and then it'll be uploaded shortly thereafter. Uh, can you go over like, uh, when you do a cylinder, how do you do the lines, like, uh, the straight lines, but under perspective, it's going to be a bit round. So like, yeah, they're, they're not, they're, they're, they won't be straight lines at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I meant, like uh, if you look straight at it, you know, it's it's straight. But if you look at it with perspective, it's gonna be curved. Okay, so it depends on what kind of cylinder. Is it like towers that had tiles on them, and those yeah. are lined.
I might not be on the right network. Maybe that's why it's so choking. No, I'm on the right network. Okay, so let's just say that this is your cylinder. You got that chunk down here. You got that chunk up there. Presuming you're talking about a vertical cylinder. Okay, well, each one of these, as you get closer towards the horizon line, any ellipse that's associated with that cylinder is gonna get thinner and thinner, and then thicker and thicker as it gets further away. So any detail that was associated with this area that's wrapping around the contour of that thing is gonna take on that overall shape. But then that's gonna get a little flatter here and a little flatter there. And pro tip with when you come to the edge, try not to do this, where you just bring it up to the edge and then have it stop immediately. Try to think about it as if you're wrapping around that. Right? So it's almost like you're progressing over top of the edge a little bit as a way of making that thing feel like it's wrapping around the surface and continuing. Okay, so, I mean, these could be the steel plates that I was talking about right, on the tower that I was drawing or the chimney I was drawing, right? Or this could be a door right, or a window. Now, if you're drawing a cylinder like this, then it's different. You'd have lines that would be going back like this, but then you'd have contour lines that were all circular because each individual one of those circles going back is just a smaller circle. There is no elliptical shift but any sort of surface detail that was wrapping around like this is now going to be dependent upon that sort of shift. If we were dealing with this in two point, now we'd have an ellipse here and a different ellipse here. And now we'd have a series of ellipses like that, right? So now these would control the contour of details on the side of that object. And then any sort of, let's say that we took this and laid this down, the sides of these windows and doors and plates, <laughs> right, would all be going back there. Okay. Well, but it's pretty much the same as one point perspective in this case, right? It is with the exception that this is circular, this is elliptical. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, makes sense. Right. Okay, any other questions? I just want to clarify which stages you want us to show because the assignment says five, but the example shows yeah, three. So like I said, when we were going through that, right, is that don't worry about that. All I want you to show is that mass shape ISO, right, drawing, two, right, the geometric shapes, right, that make that up, and then three, pattern, detail. Okay, so I'll probably go in almost immediately here and change that handout okay. right, and then simplify, simplify that process. Okay. Okay, any other questions? All right, gang. Well, if uh, you don't have questions, then uh, you are free to go. Um, I will see you again next Friday. Enjoy your weekend and all that jazz and whatever the week has to offer next week. For those of you who have questions individually and want to ask them, stick um, around. Now's your time. Uh, 
I have a question about homework because I'm I'm not good at English. So, uh, so we have a three assignments in here, right? So, uh, to draw nine lips, nine ellipses, and the other thing is to draw something like a house with all of the objects included. Yes. So the examples that I was showing you. Uh, uh, where can I get that example? Were you watching the examples that I was showing you? Uh, yeah, I watched it, but I don't know where can I get that. Okay, so that's going to be in your handout. Uh, in so, Moodle. Yes. So okay. let me go to let me go to Moodle. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Um, so, yeah. Here we go. This is you guys here. Okay. So, you click on that. And then you go down to here, topic two, compound object design. Click on this. And that gives you the handout. And then, as you go through that handout, this is what your assignment is. This page here, this page here, there, and there. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and again, I will go in and tidy this up immediately and then re-upload this. So don't download the handout for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes after class, right? Because it'll just take that amount of time to get it sorted out. And do I have to hand out with PDF? <coughs> Sorry, what? Do I have to hand out this with PDF or just P PNG or JPG like things? PDF, please, only, ever. Uh, okay, thank you. If I don't have a question, am I good to go? Sorry? If I don't have a question, am I good to go? Yeah, anybody who doesn't have a question, you are free to go. I will see you next week. Wow, that. Okay, thank um, you, all right. Thank you. Yeah, no have a good weekend. Yeah, you too. You guys have a good weekend. All right. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Have a good weekend. <laughs> thank have you. Have a nice weekend. Goodbye. Night. Thank you. Oh, uh, Jay, is it going too far if I ask you like uh, about doing trees and things like that? Trees? Yeah. No, not at all. Because I was thinking, like, uh, uh, I pretty much see this kind of stuff, like drawing side boxes and basic shapes, and then like you carve them out. You know, like if you if it was know. a stone, and then you just carve it. Uh, and I was thinking, like, whoa, a tree might be too much, because then you gotta carve it a lot. You know. Well, you would approach it in a you would approach it in a different way. Mm -hmm. So this is just one way of approaching a drawing. It's just a particularly useful way to get people to start thinking about it in this way. But let's say we take just like a really simple example of a tree, right? We got that shape and we've got that shape. Okay. Well, oh, that, I see. But that becomes really easy to manipulate in perspective, right? Because I can then take that shape and that shape and start to deal with them dimensionally. Right? And then I can start to change you know, the nature of the details or the form of that shape. And then inside there, start to subdivide that even more. Where now it feels like there's maybe some volume inside there. Uh, but like, 
is this one ready to be used in like any kind of perspective? Pretty much like uh, uh, no matter uh, from where you look at it, just like maintaining the the same horizon line. No. Okay. Right. So if I was to look at that tree, like this, this kind of presupposes a horizon line right about there. Yes. Yes. But let's say that I want to look at that tree entirely below. Well, now I've got to imagine how much of this overlaps that as opposed to the opposite here. Mm -hmm. And because now I'm doing an entirely different kind Draw. I see. Uh, just for the sake of the example, uh, let's suppose that the like the bushes and other thing, it's gonna stay the same because it's a drawing, it's not an actual three. But like, uh, if I walk, uh, let's say like I'm looking at the three like straight. Uh, if I walk like a bit to the right, is it gonna be like uh, per perspective wise accurate? Like this three, the 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 first one that you drew. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that was just like. What I was thinking about, because you probably right, don't but, have to do all the perspective uh, grids it, and shit to do trees, think right? About it, think about it. Think about it this way, right? Is that if you look, if you look straight down on a square, right, that's in one point, and then you turn that square into two point, that makes a difference, but. If I put a circle in here, it's going to be the same. It's going to be the same. I see. So what's going to change, obviously, is like as you move from, say, one side of the tree to the other side of the tree, if there's a hole over here and you can see it from over here, well, the details are going to change. Right? But the overall shape of that thing, at least in this simplified example, isn't going to change. Now, that would be different if you had, say, something that, you know, was twisting and turning. Right, and look different depending on your angle of relationship to it. But it's not going to change from one point or two point or anything like that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me uh, now that you explain. Okay. Spencer, you got a question? Uh, yeah. Uh... Just a bit like on this side, um, how do you deal with uh, motivation, especially, uh, you know, part of the homework is really technical and really just, I don't know, it's, it's easy to get burnt out in, in my uh, perspective. Yep. Um, well, I mean, the best way is to make it mean something to you. Um, and, you know, there's a number of different ways of doing that. Some people just appreciate the intellectual exercise of it um you know but if you're not one of those if you're not one of those people like i find that that doesn't really work for me very well um what does work for me is that i need to make it i need to have some sort of like cash value practical applicability right for it so if i'm just learning things out of interest generally my history is speckled with me not remembering that information as soon as i start using that information, right? That information becomes much more valuable to me and as a result, much more interesting to me. So, you know, you need to figure out a way of making it interesting for you. So like, for instance, like, what are you planning on going into? Uh, animation, maybe. Right, what aspect of animation? Compositing, rigging, modeling, background design, what? Uh, I think keyframing. Sorry, what? The, like uh, keyframing like the beginning process like the choreography okay so you're going to be animated yeah you want to be animated okay well even with animated right you're going to need to deal with perspective let's say that you're doing something like a walk cycle four-legged three-legged two-legged whatever it doesn't matter right and your job right is to get a character to walk from here to here Right, figuring out how perspective right, contributes to that. 
right? That's an immediate relationship rate right, between how perspective is going to be useful for you here as or, or in your future. And, you know, something that you know, might make it more interesting for you now. Right? Likewise, right? Say that you're animating a character, but that character is just an upshot. Right? So say that you're dealing with a, a character and And you've got to figure out how to make that character believable right, inside that perspective. Right? Well, that's another immediate application. You're not going to be animating, hopefully anyway, right, in just two dimensions. Right? You're going to have like, let's say, say that it was something as simple as say, an arm coming forward and then an arm swinging backward in space, right? That's an immediate application of what does an ellipse look like in perspective? So there's an example that I'll show you guys next week uh, from Who Framed Roger Rabbit, where there's you know, an animated clock, for example. Right, with a, a pendulum on it, right? And there is a scene with, you know, one character, a baby, literally kind of like hanging on to the clock, right? And reaching for some cookies, right? Well, that pendulum is swinging back and forth as this character is holding on to it. All of that's in perspective, right? So that baby is getting smaller, and bigger right, as they come forward and backward. So, I mean, those are a number, I mean, there's an infinite array of examples, right, for this, but ultimately in terms of motivation, it needs to mean something to you. Like you need to, especially if you're gonna be doing this for a living and I don't care whether or not it's animating, making films, photography, painting, drawing, right, whatever. If it doesn't mean anything to you, if you don't like it, you know, you got to seriously take a look at that, right? Because there's easier ways to make money. Thank you. That helped a lot. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, okay. I have a question about the assignment because I passed it late. You passed it, you handed it in late? Yeah. Why'd you hand it in late? I was having some internet problems and um, I just couldn't upload it to Moodle. Like it said it was one minute late and I just couldn't upload it. That's why I... Hey, email it to me at my VFS account. Yeah. I did email you, but like, are there any repercussions or like anything? No, about it? I believe you. That's fine. Okay. I'm, um, so, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. It happens. Yep. Sir, I also had like some difficulties accessing my uh, Moodle account from my devices, and uh, I was gonna ask if I could like email it to you. Yeah, just email it to me as soon as possible, please. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Jay. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Jay. Okay, thanks, Kenzo.